regime, Afghans celebrated the birth of new freedoms, a free press, a role for women, and eventually the first democratically elected head of state. But the Americans had made it clear from the start that they weren't there to rebuild Afghanistan. That was a job for Hamid Karzai's new government. The US insisted that public safety in Afghanistan should be a responsibility for the Afghans, despite the fact that at this point the country had no army and no police force. The US Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, said it would be a fool's errand to get more involved in a tribal society as complex as Afghanistan. Rumsfeld said US forces would use their influence to prevent outright fighting, uh, but that nobody would do peacekeeping or public security outside Kabul. You can get that in Colchester, would you? Britain led the first group of international forces to assist with the security of Kabul. That left 80% of the country, more than twice the size of the UK, unsecured. Who did Secretary Rumsfeld think then was going to keep law and order if it wasn't going to be a, a, a stabilization? My, my view is he did not care. How did he imagine uh, that uh, stability was going to arise out of I a... Don't think, I don't think he cared about stability. He, he was intent, and give him his credit, on, on, uh, on dismantling and destroying al-Qaeda. Mm. Uh, I don't think he was uh, intent at all on what the Afghan of the future, the Afghanistan of the future would look like. It's generally right not to put ourselves in the business of trying to govern a very foreign country for which we had neither the cultural nor the linguistic capacity to do it, and which would have dragged us into Afghanistan, Afghan quarrels, and pretty soon we would be the problem. Not as an occupying power, but it's beyond our competence. On the other hand, I think we should have done more to build up the Afghan capability to provide for their own security. security force. If there's one thing I would wish we had done, it was to use the time when things were relatively quiet. Karzai had no militia of his own. His interim government, brokered by the UN, included warlords, the same people whose violence and corruption had given rise to the Taliban. While they occupied cabinet seats in Kabul, their militias filled the power vacuum outside. People forget that he didn't create this administration. We did, with the international community, uh, including the United Nations, including myself. We formed this government, and we told him, please come to Kabul and lead this group. We allied ourselves with former warlords, and our objective was to destroy al-Qaeda and we very much then created and empowered a, a group of uh, political actors not accountable and also uh, people who, as they grew in power, actually caused more instability. In all this, the Taliban, who just months earlier had been the government of Afghanistan, seemed to have just vanished. I was one of the people who was saying, look, where are the Taliban? The, you know, these people controlled 90% of, of the country a few weeks ago. And what was the response? Uh, the response was, it's useless. You said, they have been defeated, it's gone, finished, they will never come back. Within six months of the invasion, Britain and America began to avert their gaze from Afghanistan, preoccupied by another matter. Preparations for the war in Iraq biggest single mistake, just one, probably Iraq. We didn't know then. You know, the most important player in Afghanistan to the Americans was absent-minded from day one, was looking somewhere else. The world was now focused almost exclusively on Iraq, while Taliban gunmen started to cross the porous border into southern Afghanistan. It was March 2003, just 18 months after the invasion. The Taliban were back. The Taliban went into to Kandahar 
um, and they were looking for targets. And, you know, there were very few targets. I mean, who, you know, there were just Afghans living there. There were no foreign troops there. There were a few Afghan government representatives who really weren't worth killing as far as the Taliban were concerned in those early days. So the Taliban just went further and further in to Afghanistan looking for targets. The United Nations in Afghanistan has ordered its staff not to travel by road through the area where an international Red Cross worker was murdered last Thursday. He was ordered out of his car by a group of armed men and then shot. You had American generals sending off cables saying, you know, something is happening, sending cables even to Rumsfeld. And I think Rumsfeld ignored them. The White House ignored them. We clearly have moved from major combat activity to a period of, of stability and stabilization and reconstruction and uh, activities. It was the forgotten war of 2002 to 2005. The Taliban were reorganizing. They were licking their wounds and figuring out what to do next. There wasn't a heavy British or coalition loss and the country seemed to be relatively stable. It wasn't a war on the front pages. And yet, the Afghan war was far from over. In fact, it was about to reignite. By 2005, NATO was in control and did what Washington had so opposed at the start. They increased troop numbers and inched towards nation building. NATO wanted to extend the authority of the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, beyond Kabul. Britain took on Helmand province. It was suggested that I should go down to this place called Lashkagar. And uh, everybody said, look, it's, it's not entirely safe, but you'll be OK. Boarding an old Russian helicopter, Britain's Foreign Office Minister decided to take a look for himself at Lashkagar, capital of Helmand province. And as we came into Lashkagar, uh, I, I saw down below me uh, this bulgest fort. The commander was, was a guy called Colonel Hogberg. I said, what's it like here? And he said, well, sir, it ain't the end of the earth, but you can see it from here. He said, you could be wandering into a fight between two tribes or sub-tribes or villages over water rights. You could run into a, uh, a, a drugs convoy. And, and he pointed out to me some of these drugs columns actually had anti-aircraft missiles on them. You could be running into Taliban or just a village that didn't like strangers. He said, we don't hang around because you never know who's shooting at you. I mean, this, this really struck me at the time as being a, an observation we ought, we ought to take a bit of notice of. Helmand had little infrastructure, few public services, no functioning security, economy or justice system. The Blair government's vision for Helmand, however, did not lack for ambition. The original vision was that uh, Karzai would be able to create a growing and sustainable peace, and that this would create a space in which governance would, would spread. And some people likened this to creating, uh, creating Belgium in a couple of years. A team of experts was dispatched to Helmand by Whitehall in late 2005. Their task was to plan the delivery of this vision with troops providing protection and expected home in just three years. It was a task of biblical proportions. It was a medieval province, vast open spaces. There was no infrastructure. I remember flying across the province's only road. Corruption ran from top to bottom. So when one looked at all of this, one saw a, a rudderless expanse of not much, uh, where the principal economy uh, was drugs. Some estimates said that 80% of the population were illiterate, and that extended to many key functions in government, including the, the director of education, uh, who could not read or write. We didn't know how many police stations there were, and the chief of police wasn't really sure either. There were sporadic outbursts of violence um, because of the drug trafficking. And when I asked the American officer 
what background research I should do to understand Helmut a little better. He said I should watch The Sopranos. On their return home for Christmas, the planners met up with their Whitehall masters. The planners told them their vision for Helmand was unrealistic. The overwhelming impression I had of that afternoon was of the clock ticking. The conclusion that, um, that this was not achievable in three years uh, was, not, was not an acceptable conclusion. There was uh, an unforgiving timeline and there was no time for discussion. The planners were told to get on with it, but they weren't the only ones asking awkward questions. The Foreign Office Minister wrote to the Ministry of Defence. We had planned to go down there with 3,300 troops. Um, we had 30,000 in Northern Ireland. Are we sure that, that we're going to be able to do something about this? And, and have we got enough helicopters? Have we got enough water? Can we, you know, can we do all of this? The general said yes, yes, and yes. The military momentum was unstoppable. Britain was going to Helmand, come what may. Sixteen Air Assault was the brigade chosen to provide protection for the reconstruction mission. They did anticipate some fighting. There was an awful lot of grenade launcher practice going on down the ranges. <laughs> um, and there wasn't much of a cue for the development brief. There are a lot of stripped down vehicles going past with 50 cows on the top. This was, I think, every soldier's dream, Afghanistan. Hugely historically resonant, extraordinary country, classic soldiering. Perhaps as a former soldier myself, I, I understand that. My sense was that they had come with a larger place in the plan for malleting the Taliban. No, I mean, I dispute that. I mean, I'd, I'd been in the military for two dozen years. I'd been on a lot of operations. I knew the consequences of, of the, the wrong use of force. I'd been in Afghanistan twice before. The force deployed gave a maximum of only 800 fighting soldiers. So the reconstruction mission was limited to the central area of Helmand around the capital, Lashkagar. Out on patrol in Helmand, the British troops have arrived and are introducing themselves to their new neighbours. Good, fine, thank you. How are you? Do you understand why the British are 